the Mystic, which is part of the Museum Lates program funded by the Northern Ireland Museums Council. Uh, I'm Colleen Murphy from Classic Album Sundays. Uh, just a few housekeeping rules. Uh, first of all, could you all please put your phones to silent or even if you're extremely adventurous, possibly even turn them off completely. Um, the way the evening is going to go is we're going to have a talk about the album, then we're going to listen to the album from beginning to end on this gorgeous audio file hi-fi provided by Kronos Audiovisual. And while the album is in play, I just ask that you refrain from all conversation and you just devote yourself and give yourself over to the music entirely. And that's the reason I started Classic Album Sundays eight years ago, because I felt our listening habits had really changed, that we ha weren't really listening to music collectively um, and thoroughly listening to entire albums and really giving ourselves the time and space to completely devote ourselves and give ourselves over to music as opposed to some kind of oral wallpaper in the background, you know, that's kind of just scoring our lives as opposed to being the focal point. So that's what these Classic Album Sunday sessions are for, to completely give ourselves over to the music and also to hear the music in detail that you may never have heard the albums before in this kind of detail, uh, especially with these audiophile hi-fis. And I'll go through the, the system with you a little bit later, um, but Kronos Audiovisual really pulled out all the stops here and uh, they're a shop just down the road, just 12 miles down the road, and I'll introduce those guys a bit later. In any case, we're here to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Van Morrison's masterpiece, Astral Weeks. It was released 50 years ago, actually this week. It's one of my personal favorite albums of all time. I was born uh, the month that it was recorded, August 1968. Maybe I'll edit that part out of this podcast. Uh, <laughs> and I was actually born just outside Boston, and that's where Van Morrison was living at the time. Uh, he was living in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, in fact, the back cover of the album talks about Hyannisport and Cape Cod. Uh, he, he did record the album, of course, in New York City. But I always wonder if I had some kind of connection to this album, even before I was aware that I had a connection to it. I mean, this is an album that's really seen me through some of the most emotionally and spiritually significant moments of my life. Um, it accompanied me in the streets of New York City when I was a free-spirited, you know, 18, 19, 20-year-old, or actually 23-year-old, which is about the, the age that Van Morrison was when he recorded this album in New York City. It's an album that accompanied me when my daughter was born and when she was a child, a young child. It's also an album that's given me solace um, when loved ones, dear loved ones, have, have passed to the next realm. It's also an album that's inextricably linked to the people of Northern Ireland and also to the birthplace of its creator, Belfast. It's almost lent Belfast a mythological status, much like uh, Route 66, Cypress Avenue is almost a little bit like that. It's almost like a source of cultural tourism. And it's really an album that reflects the myriad identities of Northern Ireland. It's the, the, the literary tradition, all the different musical influences. It's one that's given solace to the people of Northern Ireland during the Troubles, and also maybe given hope and kind of some kind of pride to uh, the Northern Irish in the days and the decades after the Good Friday Agreement. So joining me today to discuss this wonderful album is a man who also has a real connection to this record and it, for, it has a lot of great meaning to you. He's a broadcaster with BBC Ulster. He also has a book out, which I am going to read very soon, called uh, Trouble Songs, Music and Conflict in Northern Ireland. And he is also a van enthusiast and lives in Van Land, somewhere around the corner from Cypress Avenue. Please give your hand, uh, hand to Stuart Bailey. So Stuart, why don't we talk about Belfast and the Belfast of um, Van Morrison's childhood, the East Belfast of his childhood growing up and the Belfast that he's really yearning for when he's living in the States and he's looking back. Can you 
take us a, give us a little walk down Hindford Street. Well, uh, Bloomfield is the, the parish right. where, where Van grew up. Um, he, he, he called it, a, in recent times, he called it his Blakean microcosmos. Right. So um, it's, what, a square mile, something like that. It's very small. It's part of East Belfast, and it's bordered by rivers and pylons and, 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 and tributary roads. Um, Van Morrison uh, lived at this, uh, basically the loop and the, uh, the, the Conswater River come down. Uh, he called it the Beachy River. Uh, and it's a marshy, uh, at one stage it had been a mill, uh, cheap marshy slob land mm -hmm. is where Hindford Street is, is two streets up from, from this little river. And uh, my, my memories of, of, of of the Conswater River back in the day was that it stank because all the <laughs> pollutants from the factories were just poured into it and it was the usual shopping trolleys and everything else. It's been landscaped now and it looks really beautiful and the hollow which is mentioned in Brown Eyed Girl is down in this little depression down by the, 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 the Beachy River. Uh, that part of Belfast was landscaped really to house there was a great Victorian expansion in Belfast in the, in the, in the 1880s, 1890s, and uh, linen being the primary thing, but heavy industry became part of that as well. So they needed to get a lot of people out of the country, get them in the mills, get them in the shipyards. So they built row upon row of very tightly uh, compacted terraced houses. So Hindford Street is built for purpose. Uh, it's not particularly pretty but the Belfast brick is a beautiful red brick and it it, 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 it has its own aesthetic and, and you know Hanford Street still stands there. He, he, he grew up in number 125. His father was an electrician in the shipyard, George, and his mother Violet um, at some point worked in a mill. She was a drawer. I, I still don't know quite what a drawer did or, 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 or did. But, but that was his childhood. He was an only child. His father uh, got most of his, he was an avid uh, record collector, so he would have um, brought home Mahalia Jackson, John Lee Hooper, um, the Carter family, uh, all of these things that, that, that were very rare in Northern Ireland. He sourced them uh, from, it was a guy called Sully Lipsitz, who was the, 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 the jazz head of Belfast. He had a shop on High Street called Atlantic Records, and that's where Van father brought home records from Hank Williams and the Carter family and Jimmy Rogers and all of that. So, you know, uh, you know, how much do we know about Van Morrison? He's not, he's, he's not a great giver in interviews and media, but he talks a lot about the obsession with the record and the information and the signs and the transcendence that came out of those records. So out of this very prosaic part of town, uh, and, and when I was growing up, I was born in 61, my memory of East Belfast is smog and dust. You know, there's just chimneys belching black smoke all the time. So it wasn't a pretty place. And then at the key moments, at the start of the day and the end of the working day, the shipyard workers and the bills would just come pouring onto the New Park Road and, you know, work their way home. And you can hear that. And, you know, when I, when I hear the saxophone on End of the Mystic, you know, I hear that fog or an, uh, blast. That is, that's East Belfast, you know, and, and the East Belfast of Astro Weeks is, I guess, totally imbued with romanticism, you know, it's, 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 it's not a real world, it's a poetic vision of all that, but from Hangford Street, there's a, a very short leap to Cypress Avenue, which is upper middle class, where the judges and the lawyers and the doctors live, 85 trees, it's away from the marshland, it's <coughs> up on the hill, and uh, that's, you know, part of the, 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 the beauty in that record is the, the working class boy is drawn to this gorgeous avenue and the, possibly the beautiful young ladies who lived <laughs> in those houses. A bit out of his reach, maybe. Yes, yes, posh totty, some right. call it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And what was the religious landscape like in East Belfast? Well, uh, East Belfast, primarily Protestant. There are areas such as Short Strand, which were Catholic stroke nationalists, but 
certainly Bloomfield would have been part of the Protestant experience. Uh, th he sings about the Sunday six bells on the, on the song Beside You, and that's at the corner of, of Bloomfield Avenue and Beersbridge Road, and that day they have these beautiful bells which ring out at 11 o'clock every Sunday morning and, and it's Sunday evening as well. Uh, so that's Church of Ireland, so that's the very grand, the high church. But around the corner is Presbyterian, and then all of a sudden you go around another corner and there's Elam or there's Baptist, or you know, all the flavors of Pentecostal religion are there, uh, non subscribers, splitters, street preachers, you know, this whole thing. And, and that, the, the further down you get from, from high church, the more explosive and excitable, and uh, that this whole thing about your, you know. It's, it's, it's a Northern Ireland thing, but it's, it, it, it exists in lots of other places, including America, that you tell your testimony, you talk about when you were saved, you try and save other people, and you can literally walk down the Newton Orange Road on a Saturday night, and people are still doing that. So the, the, that kind of the roar, the talking in tongues, the, the, you know, that, that whole thing that, that leads back to the Bible and the Acts of the Apostles is part of the texture and the flavor, certainly of Astro Weeks and Vans expression i think i think you know he, he gets it from mahalia jackson but he also gets it from the streets of east belfast i think and his parents are quite interesting because they were real free thinkers i mean his father i believe was an atheist at one point his mother was a jehovah's witness at another point but it seemed like they uh had their own kind of spiritual quest which maybe seemed to and this this whole atmosphere of east belfast with the different uh, denominations and the, and the different and the street preachers that seem to kind of fuel a spiritual quest in in them yeah and there, there was there, there's an rte documentary which is still online went out a few days ago and, and it's a uh, it, it, it um uh, van's partner janet janet planet, janet planet. Uh, yeah yeah she talks about the parents quite a lot and ones in that you know the father is an introvert the mother is an extrovert but in ways very typical of the place and they did work that was very typical of the place but at the same extent they were these incredible individuals in this very tightly you know they're in the middle of this this terrace street but they're they're they're, they're tuning their their wavelengths to, to other things mm -hmm. you know everybody was uh, interested in american culture post-war but i think that his father and mother almost realized that there was depths of music that other people didn't want to go to or didn't care didn't choose to go to and um you know the father introverted the mother i seen her a few times out and about and she was a great dancer you know like you very loving the music and, and into the music you know literally you know you know yeah. shaking it you know <laughs> so uh so yeah i think he's got both those strains in his, his own temperament and he speaks about when he heard people like Lonnie Donegan or Lead Belly. It was like a spiritual experience, but also creating music. It's interesting what he said. This is from a conversation in 1987 with the novelist Desmond Hogan. He said, in terms of how he created music, I'm just channeling. That's what I do. I say it's a collective unconscious. That's what I prefer to call it. I'm channeling these ideas that are coming through me from wherever they are. I don't know. I myself am not actually saying anything either way. I just get ideas coming through. It might be a line, a bit of melody. I develop these things that come through the subconscious mind and put shapes on them and they become songs. So let's discuss the mystical quality of Astral Weeks and the stream of consciousness sense of the lyrics. Do you think there is, oh, first of all, do you think there is a mystical quality to Astral Weeks? Yeah. Um, you know, when he's in Ben and he's writing songs and, 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 you know, 60s blues songs were not particularly sophisticated. A lot of times they were, you know, uh, under my thumb or, you know, satisfaction or, you know, they're mostly about sex. Um, but, but one of the first songs that Van records of his own is, is called Mystic Eyes, which is about going past the graveyard and being smitten by a girl at the same time. So he's, he's sort of the, the, mortality and and love and sex and you know so he becomes this lightning catcher for a different way of of of, of kind of talking about popular culture um and and uh you know shortly after um 
Astro wakes his moon dance and, and it starts with Annette Stone May about this. He goes up the Valley Stockard Road up Cumberway and, and and he meets this guy and he has a drink off him and 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 suddenly he has a thunderbolt experience where, where time stands still. And you're kind of going, Well, that never happened to me when I went up the Cumber, <laughs> you know. Um, so uh, whatever however you rate that in, whether that is a a biochemical condition, whether that is uh, uh, someone who's able to access another dimension, uh, I think we can assume that, that, that Van Morrison was possessed of a different way of experiencing the world. Mm. And, um, you know, inside the side of you, he's conquered and carsick. Something, this moment, just smites him and he's, he's completely incapable of doing anything. And, and, and again, uh, with uh, Anne, it stoned me. So, um, and, and, and interesting, when, when he, he was at the Lyric talking to Michael Longley and he talks about Bloomfield as a, mic, a Blakean microcosmos. So what was William Blake about? William Blake um, saw angels in Dulwich Hill. He, uh, he heard cosmic voices in Peckham Rye. You know, he was a, an East End boy without any great opportunities in his life, but, but he... He was a visionary, you know, and, and uh, it was in his paintings, it was in his poetry. And uh, I think Van Morrison's probably the closest thing in popular music you'll get to someone like William Blake, who's literally, this is happening, and I don't know what it is, but I'm going to rant and roar and shake and, 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 and repeat syllables and chase the word until it takes me to somewhere as close as I can articulate where, where that is. I don't know if I'm even making sense at this point, <laughs> but um, but yeah, they, you know, he had an album called The Inarticulate Speech of the Heart, and yeah. I think all the time he's trying to give voice, he's trying to say this is what it's about. I can't really explain it, and the only way I can explain it is when I'm on stage or when I'm in a studio, and the 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 the, the, the microsecond between that syllable and that syllable is as close as I can take you, you know. Mm. You were mentioning uh, Blake, but also he's been compared to W.B. Yeats, of course. But in this um, uh, same interview with Desmond Hogan, he says, somebody wrote an article about me a while back. They were trying to say there were similarities between my songs and Yeats' poems. At the time, it seemed like a good idea. Through further exploration, I discovered it's not my lineage. My lineage would be... A.E., George Russell, that's more my lineage, that sort of mysticism as opposed to Yeats' mysticism. Now, of course, they have a collection of A.E.'s paintings, of George Russell's paintings downstairs, and so I thought it might be interesting to kind of look at, well, we talked, you picked out a couple paintings, this one here, um, which is called it, it, The Spirit in the Pool. You picked this one out in particular, and I was wondering, first of all, if you could tell us a little bit about George Russell. Uh, George Russell, his paintings are downstairs. There's, there's a lot of people in this room that probably know more than, than, than we do, uh, but we can only surmise or, or say what we know. He was a, a, a kind of a, a Lurgan man. He, he was from this part of the world. Uh, his father was originally in linen production, then he moved down to Dublin to be part of the brewing industry. Uh, so he was 11 when he, when, he, when he left Northern Ireland. He uh, went to art school in the evening while doing clerical work during the day, and he met W.B. Yeats at art school, and they became kind of rivals and, and soulmates. And I think W.B. Yeats envied him because W.B. Yeats was chasing the mystic, well, where is this, what is it, where's the trembling of the veil, how do I get through the veil? And, and, and A.E., George Russell, was in it. You know, he literally went, you know, when I was a kid, I heard tinklings of bells and voices, you know, you know, I, I don't know how this happened or where this happened. And, and um, I, I think Yates talked about when he was at, at, at art school and they were doing still lifes. So everybody's painting this guy sitting on a chair and, and, and George Russell's painting an angel coming in through the window and stuff. And, and he couldn't, it was like, you're meant to paint the, you know, the bloke in the chair and he's gone, but this thing happened, you know. So he, you know, so... That was what the Celtic Twilight was about to a degree. You know, there was this whole let's reinvent the, the Irish imagination. Let's let's read about Cahillan and let's read about you know the the, the town and then, you know all these great stories and 
and let's relate it to other things. And at, at this stage, I guess that Victorian era, lots of people are exploring and, and looking. Partly, I think they think we, we can use science to calibrate this the, the mystic. So, you know, people like Arthur Conan Doyle is, is kind of going down that road. And uh, the, there are these uh, things like uh, theosophy, mm -hmm. which is uh, Madame Blavatsky, and, and how can we look at the Eastern mystery, mystery tradition, and how can we look at the, the Western, and, and try and put it together, and put together this this way of living, and this way of looking at the, this other dimension. Mm -hmm. um, so AE, I think, lived that, and uh, you look at his paintings downstairs, or you look at something like this, and and this is where his head was at, you know. And um, uh, I, th I think that was a Willie. Willie Yates, Yates, his dad, said, what was it he said? He's a saint, but he's a saint from Portadown. You know, it was like, <laughs> it was like uh, yeah, he's one of those Nordies, you know. He's from the, the, the Black North, the Industrial North. What does he know about it, you know? And, uh, you know, you could say, to Baba Marzen, he's a saint, but he's from he's from, you know, Bally Hackamore. You know, it's kind of like it's, it's funny. You know, you people who don't uh, who don't behave uh, to the norm to the script that's been presented to them. But but that's that's what happens. They've got this this complete strange way of experiencing the world, and I guess that's why they become artists. One thing that was uh, really interesting that George Russell wrote, I'm going to try to find it, it was in the catalog uh, here, is he says, and he's talking about the actual process of painting. He says, let the motive for action be in the action itself and not the event. That it is right to do things for the sake of doing them and not for praise or profit or any such motive. I can do that with painting. Now, in a sense, Astral Weeks was recorded very quickly. I mean, these are some of the songs he had kind of put together. He had been recording, performing them live at the Catacombs in Boston. But the album itself, the actual recording, was done incredibly quickly. He had some session musicians with whom he barely communicated. He had Connie Kay from the uh, Modern Jazz Quartet, Jay Berliner, who had worked with Mingus on The Black Saint and the Sinner Lady, Richard Davis, who I believe was Downbeat Musician of the Year. Some, I mean, amazing jazz musicians. And he hardly even spoke to them. Uh, it's kind of very similar to the way D Dylan recorded Blood on the Tracks, actually. Hardly even going and speaking to the musicians, introduce themselves, giving them directions. There's no guide sheets. It was just like play. They, they didn't even realize that they were actually being recorded. It's like, what? That's, that's the take that you want? And it seemed almost like it was just something he had to kind of purge and get out. And it was more about the moment rather than just endlessly perfecting something. And for the final product, it was more about the actual process. And although I, you know, I don't think there, there's direct um, inspiration from George Russell A.E. onto any particular songs in Astro Weeks, maybe that kind of process is something that is, has a similarity to, to George Russell's process. Yeah, it's about intuitive leaps. It's about trying to free that thing inside you rather than, you know, when, when he's doing Brown Eyed Girl uh, with Bert Burns a year before, it's the pop 